Here to discuss why most BDCs are broken is Sean Bradley, CEO of Dealer Synergy. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you, everybody. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, this is my second workshop today. I did uh, one a couple hours ago for how to build an internet dealership. So this will be my sixth year as an NAD, uh, NADA convention speaker, but this is my first year talking about internet sales and BDC, which is my core competency. Um, some things I want to get started before, before I kind of go in because it's really relevant to this. I've been doing internet sales and BDC for about 17 straight years. I spent about five and a half years on the front lines. I was delivering about 110 units a month out of my internet BDC back in 01, 02. So after five and a half years of doing it on the front lines at that level, I started you know, the organization I'm with now. And for the last 12 years, almost 1,000 rooftops and 15,000 automotive professionals kind of gives me the information I'm going to give you today. So again, it's not a theory, it's not a hypothetical, this is like legitimate data information from 17 straight years immersed in internet sales and BDC. So just a quick uh, room check, how many people here currently have a BDC? Okay. All right, so this is a workshop for you then, I love it. Now, question for you, this is, I'm gonna set you up, we're gonna have a little fun here. How many people think they really understand what a BDC even is? Come on, don't be shy now. You just threw up your hands a couple seconds ago. All right, good. Because I think that after this workshop, you might have a different perspective on what a real BDC is and who should run it and how it should run. But uh, this is a pretty bold statement. Why do most BDCs or why are most BDCs broken or non-profitable? The number that I had that I didn't put in here, you know what I mean, is 80%. 80% of BDCs are non-profitable and or broken. As a matter of fact, manufacturers. Anybody here at Mercedes-Benz dealership in the United States? Do you know that Mercedes-Benz had a program way back in the day because they were trying to get the whole BDC concept off ground? And any dealership that had a BDC, at least in the Northeast, they would actually give retro money. I knew, I knew Benz dealerships that weren't successful. They were losing money on the actual sales, but we were making the money up in the volume and the back end money. So OEMs have tried and failed. And there's a lot of other reasons between vendors and strategy and process, and that's what this whole workshop's gonna be. So let's just get into it. Okay, so non profitable disorganized, staffed incorrectly, either explode or implode, disconnected with the rest of the dealership. So the perfect world scenario, why do people wanna have a BDC or pitch to have a BDC for the manufacturer or vendor? Because in my opinion, they say that you're gonna sell more cars, more often more profitably, right? Yes? Okay. And with a real BDC, if you incorporate service and parts and you know, data mining, equity mining, I mean, you could just turn around and do everything. It sounds good, you know, but the reality is that, from what I've found, is that uh, in, a, in a real dealership, it doesn't play out. You ever go to, <laughs> you ever watch on TV like the commercials? I don't even care if it's McDonald's or it's a restaurant, Olive Garden, and, and the damn photographs of the food looks delicious. Right or wrong, it's delicious. But when you go to the fast food, it's like a crunched up, you know, McBurger, right? The reality of it is like, that didn't look like the picture, right? That's the same thing with the visual mental picture of BDC. The concept of BDC is theoretically good, great, or what have you, but the reality is not so pretty. And that's what I'm going to keep you, and I joke around because I had to be like PG for NADA, but uh, again, there, there's no fairy tale unicorns that, that spit up Skittles. Um, it, it's very rare that you're going to be able to pull off a true BDC in the sense that you guys might think of before this workshop. Okay, so what happens? Vendors, CRM companies are really notorious for kind of pitching the concept of CRM and BDC because that's what their products are about, that you're able to consolidate and you could do front end, back end, internet, texting, all this stuff. I'm building, it's gonna, it's gonna hit in a second. Now, to make it simple, because I have 17 years I gotta pack into an hour and still give you guys some time for some questions, is the top 10 reasons why BDCs fail, then we're gonna go into them. Okay, the number one, it's not mapped out correctly. And this is not gonna be any duh, this is gonna, I'm gonna go into some real stuff. It's not mapped out correctly. Anybody heard of a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? All right, well, that rules my life. I'm, I'm actually a certified Franklin Covey trainer and it changed my whole philosophy. Dr. Covey, I actually got to work with him and I got to train under him before he passed away. And one of the things you want to write this down, he said that's brilliant is, what is the one thing, the one thing that you could do to have the most dramatic, profound effect? That ties into his third habit, put first things first. Also known as, keep, be careful of distractions disguised as opportunities. 
So again, what happens is this. this is the, I've been in the business world for 20 years. And car sales is ready, fire, and then aim. Yes or no? Ladder. You're my people. Talk to me, right? Yes, right? It's, 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 it's ready, fire, and then aim. And that's what happens with BDC. Usually, it's the OEM or the internet director, BDC director, the dealer, what have you, kind of just throw it together. So it's not mapped out properly. I'm going to show you how to properly map out a couple slides later. But to truly do BDC the right way, in my opinion, you need to begin with the end result in mind. What are you trying to accomplish in your dealership? Is it front-end sales? Is it you know, back-end sales? Is it special finance? Is it unsold showroom traffic? Do you want the BDC because your showroom people have no discipline and no accountability? They're not able to follow with their customers, so you have to have a BDC to do unsold showroom traffic, which should be a showroom a salesperson's job, my opinion. So you need to really ask those questions. Why do you think you want a BDC? What is important to you? Does that make sense? Before you start you know, uh, figuring it out, uh, like as you go. Because that is going to dictate what CRM you use. Because just to let you know, not all CRMs are equal. To be honest with you, like in my last workshop, they said, you know, what's the best CRM? If somebody had to just say, listen, really, what's the best CRM? There are CRMs that are better than others, but in my opinion, I've, uh, all these years doing this, there is not one CRM that is perfect or great. Some CRMs specialize in special finance. There's a few, but they, they do. They do really well with that. Some specialize in data mining or equity mining. Some of them are great with lead management and so on and so forth. So depending on what you are looking to do out of this initiative is going to dictate not only the modules, the people, but also the technology that's going to go with it. Does that make sense? So again, usually it's, it's, that's not thought out that far for most stores. Um, and when it's not mapped out properly, it's not just like the higher level. It's, okay, how about this? How many people do I even need in my BDC? Because I've seen BDCs in the Northeast, all over the country, but I'm based in the Northeast, but we have dealers we work with in California and all over the place that have like a 1,000 leads, and they've got three people in their BDC. And on top of doing internet and phones, they're also doing service and backup receptionist job as well. So that doesn't work out too well. So not mapping out the, the, the actual concept of the BDC is one of the most, I don't know, uh, problematic reasons. Next is dealers are doing too many things at one time. Now, let's take some special note on this one. If you have a BDC, or you have a room, and you have them doing multiple things, like I'm doing unsold show traffic, so I got my little unsold show traffic hat on. Now I'm the service BDC person. Now I'm doing internet sales. Now I'm doing special finance. Now I'm doing data mining. Now I'm doing lease retention. Now I'm handling GM hand raisers. Now I'm trying to do this. Oh, and by the way, because I'm in the internet department, I need to go check your email. Your email doesn't work. Do you get this? So what happens is dealerships, the majority of dealerships have like jacks of all trades, but they're masters in none. First thing I'm going to tell you right here is that, again, I would not have a BDC doing everything. If you want all those modules, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit here and I'll go back, is that if you want to do all that, I'm in. But don't just start out, ah, I'm going to do everything at once, and you're going to fail. You want to scale into it. Start with one or two modules, like internet sales and inbound phone ups. And then, depending on what your want, wishes are, your needs, your situation, your technology, then you're going to pick the right next modular to kind of phase into. But even if you had all the different things I just mentioned, I really do not think it's a good idea to have somebody do everything. What you should do is if you want to have unsold showroom traffic, then have an unsold showroom traffic person or persons within the BDC that specialize in only doing that. Again, I used to be a special finance director for a while too. And again, it's just special finance, uh, just buying special finance subprime leads or generating your own subprime leads. That customer, that prospect is completely different than a fresh phone up or an internet customer. So again, why are we going to train a call center rep or BDC rep to turn around and try to do all that at once when they haven't even got into rhythm or got good or great at one thing? Make sense? So if you are going to turn around and do all this stuff like that picture personifies, scale into it and make sure people specialize in certain things. Because I'd rather have, if I was running the BDC or running the dealership, I'd rather be able to know that my people that are handling my subprime leads understand credit customers. Specifically, they understand outbound special finance scripting, inbound special finance scripting, the qualifications, objections, rebuttals, process, and they own that. They own that right there. That's all they're going to handle. Now, in the, it could still be in the same room, the same call center, but that's what they specialize in, and they're going to get great at it. Anybody heard of a book called uh, Good to Great from Jim Collins? Raise your hand, I want to see who, okay, good. Or should I say great, right? There you go. But 
good is the enemy of great. So you could go here, but if you're at NADA, this is the preeminent workshop in the entire automotive industry. People come from all over the world for this information. So if you want to be the best at what you can do, then don't settle for mediocrity. So if you're not going to settle for mediocrity, you've got to have your people specialize in something. Now, does that mean that that's all they could do? Me personally, I wouldn't have them distracted with other things. But if you want to kind of distract them, then at least get them fully ramped up, not just being okay, not just being good with special finance prospects. Get them to be freaking great with them before you start contaminating them with other stuff in the dealership. Agreed? At least conceptually? Okay. Wrong people in the BDC, for the love of God. Okay. So, but I've seen it all. Because I was that guy. Because I'm short, okay? It's, you can tell, right? So, I'm, I'm 39 years old. I got into this in my, in my early 20s. 21, 22. I got in the cars. So, can you imagine me, short, safe, so I, but like looking really young and thinner? They're like, oh, he could be in the internet. That's how I got the job. It's like, give it to him. So, usually, even 17 years later, what I find working with these dealers all over the country, it's either the millennial or the Gen X person, or the internet person, the IT person, or the elephant graveyard. You know what that is? The person you want to blow out on the show on the floor. Give Bobby a shot. Bobby can't make it on the floor. Let him go in the BDC what he could do there. Sound familiar? Surprise, if he can't make it on the show on the floor, I doubt he's going to make it in the BDC. So you need to have the right people in the BDC. I'm going to get into what the right people are a little bit later. But this is a big problem. You have the wrong people. And you know what else? Starting with your internet director, strike that, your BDC director. Because there is a huge difference between a BDC director and an internet director. Is there a general manager in the United States in here? A GM from the United States, from the US? None. You are? What franchise? Ford. Ford. Okay, so you're a GM, not a dealer, correct? Okay, just pretend then if you aren't. All right, so good. So if you're a GM and if I was only a sales manager, would you be offended if I was tout myself as a GM, as a real GM? Yes or no? I would. It's like if you're not a doctor, if you're just a nurse practitioner, play your position. Don't run around fronting like you're a doctor. So my thing is that there's a lot of people that are running around with the title of BDC director that have no business being a BDC director at all. They're really either an internet director or an internet consultant, but they're not a BDC director. This, 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 uh, this role is really not regulated and it's not really understood because I don't want to confuse you, but when I kind of profile what a real BDC is and all the modules and what a real BDC director does, you'll be kind of shocked because that's the other problem. Starting from the top down, most dealerships don't have the right person being a BDC director. And then from there, they don't have the right people being a BDC consultant and they don't have the right people that are going to be a BDC agent or appointment setter. So again, if it's a hot mess from the top down, where are you going with that? Right? And don't worry, this is not the whole workshop, and this is the overview that I'm going to dive in. So not enough people in the BDC. I just did this in the other workshop. I'm, going to, I'm just going to go from here. The average dealership, NADA says that the 17,500 or approximately franchise dealerships in the U.S., they have a profile of about 10 salespeople, sales, two sales managers, and or GM, GSM. Okay, so that's 13 or 14 you know, people to handle approximately 360 you know, ups or opportunities to deliver 96 units. Let me repeat that. 12 to 13 people, which 30 to 40% is management, to handle 300 you know, ups in the showroom to deliver 96 cars. Yet, most of the, the BDCs that are intermediate size to large size are doing five times, 10 times the amount of traffic with two or three people and the wrong people at that. Most BDCs you don't have enough people in them, which kind of degrades the opportunity. Let's just, let's just carve the internet aspect here. If you've got 400 internet leads in a month, tomorrow is the new month. So let's just say for March 1st to the end of March, you had 400 fresh internet leads. You spotted 40 cars. There's 360 that you didn't sell. Now, some of them are, are inactive, bogus, changed mind, not realistic, upside down, credit challenge, whatever. But you don't start tomorrow with zero. You're gonna to start tomorrow with about 200 viable opportunities just from March. And then you're gonna have 400 fresh. Now, we work with dealers that have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 leads fresh in a month. The more volume, and we're talking about internet, we're not even talking about the whole BDC, we're just talking about internet leads here. Let's do the math again. You've got 1,000 fresh internet leads in a month. 
you spot 100 cars. You're starting tomorrow with 500. Uh, J.D. Power says that the average buying cycle is 45 to 90 days on the internet. I'm not even going 45, 90 days. I'm only trailing 30 days or less. So if you've got 500 leads starting April 1st and then you have 1,000 fresh, within the, 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 the immediate next month, you turn around and have 1,500 opportunities. I work, I can't mention which ones, but I work with certain OEMs uh, officially. And one of the biggest things that they have when it comes to internet leads is the intermediate and long-term follow process. Most dealerships do not do a good job with intermediate to long-term follow. Here's how you find out, watch this. Um, I want you to write these things down real quick. This is gonna be very valuable at an executive level. Calculate how many internet deals you sold in March, right? Let's just use a number. So the gentleman from the Ford dealership, approximately how many internet deals do you think you delivered in March or after you closed today? What do you think? Okay, so I'm gonna add a zero to it, just, just for the average purposes. Let's just say it's 30, right? If it's 30, 50, whatever the number is, go back and here's the three things I want you to add in the Excel sheet, okay? The date that the lead came in on, the date that the lead closed, and then the window period, I'm gonna repeat it. The date that the lead came in on, the date that the lead closed, and then the window period. And really simple, if you had 30, you add all 30 of the window periods up, Divide it by 30, that's gonna give you your average selling period. This is so important, because if I just told you, if your manufacturer just had told you that the average buying cycle is 45 to 90 days, you've heard that before, yes? Yes? Okay, so if your average buying cycle is 45 to 90 days, but your dealership's legitimate individual selling period is only seven to 11 days, that's my psychic forecast. I'm gonna think that your average people out there is between seven to 11 days. Do you see how it's lopsided? Most dealerships have an average selling period of only seven to 11 days on the internet alone. Forget about all the rest of the BDC stuff. Whereas the average buying cycle is 45 to 90 days, which means that you're only basically living off of the low hanging fruit. And that has to do with multiple reasons. Not enough people, not the right people, not the right processes, not the right setup in the CRM, etc. But you are missing huge opportunity with the intermediate to long-term follow-up. And I promise you that's on the OEM's radar. I had multiple OEMs bring me to corporate to talk about this one issue right here alone. Now, BDC is not in sync with other departments. Let's start with the showroom, shall we? I can't tell you how many times we go in and the situation is like an us or them. Like seriously, it's the showroom is the us or them. Let's just stick with just the internet, a little piece of the BDC first, then we'll go to service in a second. But if you, if you have internet purchase requests coming in, phone ups coming in, and you make the appointment, and there's a disconnect because the showroom doesn't understand or know the process. They don't understand the phone process, they don't understand the phone strategy, they don't understand the appointment strategy. What's worse is the sales managers. Hell, even the GSM sometimes don't even know what the scripts are, the process. It's just the only thing they really know is there's no appointments. That's how they manage. There's nothing going on. What's going on? You got appointments today? No? Okay, why not? Come on, what are you doing? But since there's a disconnect, here's one of the things I recommend if you are a franchise dealership, and this is not for hard or rare cars, but if it's like a Ford Fusion or F-150 or something like that, chances are it's available. What I would say to an internet person, one of the word tracks is, in step five of our process is, you know, I got great news for you. This is basic because it's a freebie, right? Is like, this is, I got great news for you. That vehicle is definitely available. What I've seen with my own eyes is that the prospect comes into the dealership, salesperson treats it like it's a fresh opportunity, a uh, customer in the showroom, and they say, oh yeah, I was looking for that vehicle. They said it was you know, available. Oh, I don't know why the BDC said that. They're crazy, that vehicle isn't here. And the salespeople run the BDC under the bus. Has that ever happened before? So there's a disconnect. Here's the thing, think of an Olympic race. And you've got like a baton, like you know, you have a, a relay race in the Olympics. That's the transition between, between the BDC and service. The BDC and the showroom. It needs to be a seamless transition from the internet or BDC to the showroom from that appointment comes in, or from the BDC to the service riders when that service appointment comes in. But what happens is it's like hot potato, hot potato, hot potato, you know? And that's the problem. So when the departments are not in sync, things start to fall. Now, since you all have a BDC here, then you, you should all agree with this. I'm, 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 I'm very confident that the hardest part of internet sales or lead management is getting that prospect on the phone. That's my wisdom in 17 years. The hardest part of internet sales is getting that body in, 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 on the phone or communicating. Would you agree with that? Thank you. So if you are making you know, hundreds or thousands of calls and emails, if it's taking you days, weeks, or months to turn around and, and, and follow up somebody through text, through Apple, FaceTime, Skype, yes, 
We recommend people do that. Apple, FaceTime, Skype, social media, texting, all this stuff for days, weeks, months. I'm building it up. And then it gets to the showroom and it's just dropped like it's just like a regular person. Not that you should minimize regular people, but I'm saying this, it's just a fresh up, they're starting from scratch. There's nothing worse than setting an expectation of how awesome, what's different and better about your organization to totally be undermined or drop the ball when that prospect touches your showroom. Agreed? If you do not have a dual process, a process from you know how to get the prospect to the appointment to show, and then how to handle that, then you're not going to be able to truly maximize that experience. We're in a relationship business. It's about trust. Especially again, I'm using the Ford uh, dealership just because it's you know there's 3,100 what Ford dealerships in the country right now, right? 3,100 Ford dealerships. What's the difference between your Ford F-150 and the person like not too far away from you, especially you being a small store? Nothing except for the people in the processes. That's it. It's the same truck, right? So you need to make sure that whatever you're promising them, especially with this transparent world that's out there, that your people will deliver once they come into the dealership. Now, what I've also found is that, again, I dare say this, but you know, it's got to be said, the respect level for internet is not the same for showroom, which I don't get. So usually, the BDC is like the bastard child of the dealership. The BDC director, internet director, is usually not a real manager, which I don't get. Only 92 to 99% of Americans go online before they step foot into a dealership, right? So folks, newsflash. The new showroom is the phone department and internet department. That's the new showroom. When 92 to 99% of Americans go online, guess what? That's a new showroom. When J.D. Power says that the average person that is an in-market buyer, I'm not talking about upside down, credit challenge, don't want to pay the, the, the cost of the car, but a real buyer, they only visit 1.2 dealerships. That's an NADA number. One point, that means if you don't mess it up and they're qualified to buy, they're buying if you get them to your store. Agreed? So it is imperative that your departments are in sync and they're trained together, not an us or them. They need to be trained as one holistic, synergistic, pun intended, you know, uh, environment. You guys caught that? Okay, good. I was waiting for it. <laughs> Dealers have outdated technology. I laugh at this picture. You know who you are, all right? Everybody play like Qbert or Frogger or Donkey Kong, right? Some of you have CRMs that are like old school like that, whereas other dealerships have like Xbox One or PlayStation 4. When you're playing Frogger, right, with the pixels and stuff like that, you know, other dealers are playing like Xbox, you know, one with Call of Duty Black Ops 3 zombies. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what I'm saying is that you can't use antiquated, outdated technology. If your CRM does not have social media integration in it, you're using outdated technology. If your CRM doesn't have text messaging integration in there, you're using outdated technology. If your CRM doesn't have inventory integration into it, you're using outdated technology. So again, and I'm just being transparent, just because your OEM says that these are the OEM compliant tools, doesn't mean that you have to turn around and gulp and eat it. I'm not saying be non-compliant. I'm saying pay the, the, you know, the VIG. I mean, again, whether it's a website or whether it's a CRM, pay the, you know, the OEM tax. I'm not going to turn around and just use the default tool or the antiquated defunct tool because it's shoved down my throat. I will do whatever I have to do to be compliant, but I will get tools that will help me sell more cars more often and more profitably and be compliant you know, with the public, not just the OEM. Does that make sense? Now... Common sense is your executives. There's a macro selling concept and there's a micro selling concept. If you've got an organization, a vendor, that's servicing 3,100 Ford dealers amongst other OEMs, can they really, really specialize for your individual store? The answer is no. In the camera, no, they can't. It's the same thing with the cable company. The cable company is not evil, but they just, they, I know they can't turn on and care about me as an individual person. They are built on a macro strategy. You need to find vendors and partners that care about your individual store, not 3,100 other you know, people in your franchise. Does that make sense? Anybody agree with me so far? Lopsided allocation of budget for the BDC. So again, it's like most of your dealerships are upside down. What I mean by that is you're top heavy. You have this structure, like I mentioned before, where you're putting a lot of your, your money, not just advertising, your, your, but your money and in your HR for your showroom for these minimum opportunities. So if you have like 10 salespeople, three or four managers, including the GMGSM, to sell 96 cars, but then again, you have 1,000 or 2,000 leads with three or four people, and I'm not even exaggerating, I've literally seen 
dealerships that have, forget about ROs, it's, it's off the charts of how many that are there. There's so many things that a, sale, that a BDC rep's got to do, it's not, even, it's not even comparison, it's totally lopsided, where the showroom is, is really still, for whatever reason, the main focus. The traditional thing that we've been doing for all these years, instead, the businesses have changed, it's evolved. Showroom's important. For the record, I used to average 30 cars in the showroom floor, so I, I sell cars. But this is a BDC workshop, so I want to focus on the paradigm needs to be shifted towards this. You need to make sure that you're spending and allocating the right amount of resources for BDC staffing, BDC training, BDC infrastructure, BDC technology. Because if you've got like the state-of-the-art, I don't know, uh, little spin thing that you could showcase a car that spins around on your lot, but you've got an antiquated tool that's going to cater to a thousand opportunities, you might not be spending your budget in the right places. If you've got a big green gorilla that comes every Saturday for the sale, but you have an antiquated you know, website that's not generating the right amount of business, you might be a little bit op- lopsided on where you allocate the revenue for the dealership. Most dealerships really need to start thinking about how they could turn around and really maximize the business development initiative. Not using it as an afterthought. You need to make it the main course. Before I go to the next slide, think about what I said. In 2001, 15 years ago, I was delivering 110 units from a Nissan, Nissan Kia Cadillac dealership in central Jersey. Off the internet. 17, sorry, 15 years later, and there's dealerships that are still not doing that now. You know what I mean? So it still baffles me that I've been doing internet sales in BDC for 17 years, and a lot of dealers are still, 17 years later from when I first started in the car business, are not really fully engaged with their resources, their thoughts, and their strategies. So I'm hoping after you go through the rest of the slides that it'll be towards the other side. Okay, standard operating procedures not in line with car sales in 2016 and beyond. For example, everybody knows that the number one form of communication right now is social media, right? It is. So for dealerships that don't have the ability for showroom salespeople to have access to social media, or the BDC to not have access to social media or YouTube, is just beyond me. You know, because what happens is this. Here's some numbers you want to write down. You have only about a 2 to 4% read open rate on emails. Emails are one of the worst connections possible, because, but they're free, so that's why we do them. But if you track the read open rates, forget about the caring and executing and conversions, just the read open rates are about 2 to 4% for emails. If you make an outbound phone call, it doesn't matter if it's a service call or it's a sales call, the average connection on an outbound call is an 11 to 14% connection ratio. So those are low numbers. Now, texting jumps up, but you have to be opt-in compliant. You're looking at anywhere from 50 to 70% in a connection and engagement, but again, you have to be compliant. So we advocate to our people that we work with that salespeople, internet people, and even service writers, et cetera, should be really fluent with Apple, FaceTime, and Skype. Absolutely, if you can't get your prospects to respond to your emails or your text messages, there's no restrictions for Apple, FaceTime, or Skype. There's no compliance laws, there's no do not calls, none of that stuff applies. So I can tell you what, most people are not expecting a car salesman to Apple, FaceTime them. They hear that doot, 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 they think they have a friend, gotcha. Time to talk. You need an opportunity to do business. You can't sell something to nobody, you need an audience. So the key is engagement. When J.D. Power says that the average internet uh, shopper is is visiting 10 different dealerships or websites and they're only buying, you know, they're only visiting 1.2 dealerships physically before they buy a vehicle, the game is won and lost again on the phones and internet. So if you are limiting the resources, whether it's video, whether it's, you know, uh, text messaging or it's because you don't have a text messaging uh, opt-in software. If you are not allowing them to do Apple, FaceTime or Skype, you're not doing it. Do you know that senior citizens, like my, like my kids' grandparents, like my mother and my father, stuff, you know, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, they use Apple, FaceTime to communicate with the grandkids. So if senior citizens are using that, don't you think we could use this basic technology to sell the second largest item for the average American next to a home? I think so. We heard this whole thing about millennials, millennials, millennials. Guess what? I think that you should be treating every prospect, baby boomer, what have you, with the same, same strategy to do with millennials uh, as far as it relates to, to videos and information and transparency and all that stuff. For me, video is very powerful. We see a 70 to 75% appointment show ratio. So for all you BDCs, do you want to see how you could get a 70 to 75% appointment you know, show ratio? Use a video email for appointment confirmation, straight up. 
I don't like using video emails. Here's a fact from Google. Um, trust me, I wrote a book, a real book, in bookstores about Google, and the stats that I'm going to give you are, are very valid. A video that ha that's in an email has a 200 to 300 percent higher read open rate. Okay? Now, with video, the science of communication, sight, sound, motion, and emotion, Dr. McQueevy from Forrester Research says that one minute of video is equivalent to 1.8 million written words. I'm going to repeat that. One minute of video is equivalent to 1.8 million uh, written words. Real stuff, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really profound. So I would not waste my time, because there's some trainers I see on YouTube and these blog sites that say do video emails for everybody. Don't waste your time, because if you just send a video email out, even at two to 300 times a percentage higher, if you only have a two to 4%, do the math. 300% or 400% is not a lot anyway, but it's still better than just two or 40%, make sense? So I only, my rule that I wanna share with you is I, my only rule to actually use video email is if there's been some type of engagement. If you've had a conversation with somebody, then I absolutely all the time use missed appointment, appointment confirmation, showroom sales. If I got somebody, the second they walk out, I'm doing a be back video. The second that they walk out of the dealership, before I have a cigarette, before, I don't smoke, but before I do anything, get another opportunity on the showroom floor, I'm gonna do a really strong, powerful you know, uh, video. Thank you for them coming in and send it out. That's gonna increase be backs. And it's also, like I said, for the appointment shows, it increases appointment shows. So video emails, not random ones, but structured the proper way, absolutely have a significant impact on actual shows. Make sense? And I got examples too. I just don't know if I'm gonna have time in the, in the session to get through all of them. Not enough training. I mean, I, where do we go with this? I'm not, it just, you ready for this? It's my favorite thing to say to people. Everybody, I took a shower two days ago. I did. Don't worry, I took one this morning too. Why? Showers are something that you do. Showers aren't something that you did. You get me? I made him nervous up there, right? So again, dealers turn around and say, oh, I, I did training. Like when? How often are you training on CRM? CRM is the most important, significant aspect tool for BDC. And what's sad is there's very few people that have mastered. I'm talking about like Jedi mastered it in your dealership. That is the first and most important tool that needs to be mastered by not only the internet director or BDC director, but everybody should become a, a CRM specialist, not just someone that could kind of wiggle in, wiggle out, and play like they, they, they keep the dealer happy, the internet department happy. You really need to know how to use these tools. There's so much training that, that's missing for a business development center from the director on down, whether it's time management, leadership, organization, communication. Uh, again, forget about just the, the skill set side of things. You know, like uh, objections and rebuttals and that type of stuff. What about the mindset? What about all the other stuff that goes into it? Most dealers do not turn around, and this goes into the other slides I said before about there's a disconnect, because we're not training the showroom, the sales managers, everybody is so busy, because I get it, it's a month to month business, but think of this question right here. Let's just say, God forbid, there's an accident, and you have to drive to the hospital, right? And you know, because you know your vehicles very well, like I know mine is to a T, you know, with the gas, because I travel a lot. And you know, you know that, that, the, that the, the hospital, because you got to go to the trauma center, is 15 minutes and 20 seconds away. How do you know? Because you've been there before, once or twice. And you know that you have five minutes of gas. What do you do? Are you going to bleed out? Or are you going to stop and get gas? Do you get what I'm getting at? You cannot say I'm too busy to get gas, unless you're going to bleed out and be dead. And that's the thing that dealers turn around. They look at me with a straight face and say, I'm too busy. I got stuff going on. Really? Okay. Are you too busy to stop and get gas before you go to the trauma center or you're going to bleed out? And that's what's happened is that dealers have all these great excuses why they don't invest in training, why the sales managers, the GSM and the GM don't know what the processes are. Training, training, training. It's too expensive. Okay. There's virtual training. Hell, there's free training. There's Google. The whole power. We've heard the you know, comedians say the whole power of the universe, the Oracle, is in the palm of your cell phone. So you could Google anything. You could YouTube anything. The manufacturers, and even a broken clock is right twice a day. That's a joke. It's a joke, right? But the manufacturers give some type of training. You've got workshops. You've got these seminars. But follow me on this. Information with application is just information. Information plus application equals transformation. And in other words, information is good, but if you don't apply it and utilize it, it's just information. If you want that transformation, it's information plus application equals transformation. 
You guys can use that. It's good. Not the right train. Oh, Lord. So, um, I'm pretty vocal online, and we have a, we're blessed with a lot of visibility. And I, I really, I hear a lot of crazy things, you know, of like how to set up BDCs, how to set up internet departments. Just, what you need to do is that we live in a transparent, you know, place now with the internet. Do some research. Don't just turn it and take a factory rep's word or the new internet person that you're hoping is going to change or a BDC person is going to change the world that you guys live in or even a trainer here. Figure out what makes sense. Do your own due diligence. And again, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. You know, don't, if, if you turn on it and you find, whether it's analytics in a BDC or processes, that wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, and people are still feeding you and feeding. Oh, really? It really it should be working. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You, you got to look into that, and you can't keep doing the things that you guys did before. You've got to constantly be evolving. There's a great book that I read, like I don't know, over 15 years ago. Who moved my cheese? Who read that book before? That's definitely a car guy, car girl book right there, right? Simple read, 50 pages, whatever it is, and it gets to the point. You've got to evolve. If you're not in a constant state of looking for evolution, you are in a perpetual state of transgression. I mean, you've got to constantly be looking to evolve. So what's the type of training? What type of training is what's the right training? Again, to me, it has to be what fits in with your organization. What is your social responsibility statement? What is your mission statement? What are you good at? What is your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, threats, meeting challenges? What is it? What's your value package proposition? What is different and better about you than anybody else? Unless you want to give cars away with a lot of dealers do, but if you want to max gross and max volume, it's really simple. Price is only relevant with the absence of value. So again, once you kind of get what is your organization, internet, BDC, et cetera, besides getting the vendors and partners that are going to perpetuate that momentum, what you want to be able to do is train on that because you can have the same website from another Ford dealership. You can have the same CRM from another you know, BMW dealership. But if you've got different strategies, different uh, you know, processes, different philosophies, you've got to train differently. I've got Hyundai dealers that are volume. I don't agree with it, but I've got Hyundai dealerships that'll lose 25,000 on the front end because they're making a fortune in all the back end money with the volume. So their strategy and training is completely different from somebody that's much smaller that needs to you know, max gross, et cetera. So you can't just have generic training. You have to understand what it is you want to do with your BDC and then seek out the right training for your strategy, style, demographics, your geo-targeted audience, your staff, and the different members in your team. A dealer principal needs to be trained differently. <laughs> I speak for a lot of NADA 20 groups. I spoke to about 178 NAD and NCM 20 groups. And the biggest thing I get from dealer principals and GMs, Sean, I got 50 million things on my plate. Sound familiar? What are the three things I need to, do, that I need to pay attention to? So that's a different way to train in the, the actual appointment setter. There needs to be training as it results to the BDC. A dealer principal or a GM needs some type of training and clarity. Whether they understand it or not, they need to have it. Same thing with the GSM, because their level of management, accountability, and engagement in that BDC is important. And all the way down the totem pole. Does that make sense? Now, this is where it gets fun. I got tired of doing this. I'm looking at my time check. Okay, I'm good. So, just to, to go through this little rabbit trail, um, again, let's just go through the sales. Data mining, this is, to me, what is a real BDC? It does all this and more. I got tired of writing all these little, these things here. Data mining, equity mining, conquesting, you know, ROs, parts, aftermarket, uh, conversions, meaning after the RO clears, be having, having a BDC rep that calls back for a you know, conversion. Hey, Mr. Customer, this is Sean Bradley from ABC Motors. I was calling about your experience in the service department. It's like a stealth CSI, but really it is. Did anybody tell you about the buyback program? Well, what's that? Well, that $600 you just spent for an out-of-warranty you know, vehicle, did you know that we could apply, we could refund that whole $600 and apply it towards the purchase of a brand new vehicle or certified pre-owned whatever? So that's, you know, con uh, that's service conversions. Then we've got internet sales, we've got phone sales, we got referrals, uh, fleet accounts. 
Then we've got uh, lease retention, special finance, um, F and I. I mean, at, like literally selling, you know, aftermarket products and selling F and I products or pre-selling F and I products, extended warranties, maintenance contracts, etc. And then on a digital marketing aspect, it gets dumped into BDC. Everything from websites and everything about the websites and affiliate websites to search engine optimization, pay-per-click or search engine marketing, retargeting, um, voicemail messaging. You know, I mean, like you have those uh, like those products that that have the voice messages messaging. Um, okay, then you've got video messaging, video emails, video conferencing, texting, e-cards, social media paid ads. Not to confuse with social media, like just marketing and blogging and posting like that. Then we've got, okay, you know, conventional advertising marketing, direct mail, articles and posts, newspaper, print, magazines, radio, greeting cards, signage, billboards, posters, TV, broadcast, uh, you know, and then cable. Then we've got community involvement. We've got, you know, from police uh, officers, law enforcement, first responders, military, uh, cross promotional marketing with other businesses. And then you've got uh, the all the charity organizations, cancer awareness, Hyundai dealerships. You know, Hyundai OEM is, you know, part of the, um, you know, they've raised over $100 million for pediatric cancer. Uh, there's so many different things that dealerships and your OEMs are involved in. Public events, digital PR. That's part of BDC, folks, and that's different from online reputation. Online reputation for your employment reputation, like for Indeed.com and Glassdoor.com, is different than Google reviews and Yelp reviews. You know, video testimonials, video reviews. I'm talking about digital PR, digital public relations. I stopped. I got tired of doing this, this slide. Because a real BDC has so many different modules. But a BDC is degraded. I bet you if you polled everybody, if any idea had a poll, what's a BDC? Some people think a BDC is an internet department. Some people think it's a call center. Some think it's some of this. A BDC, here's the definition that I have. A business development center is a proactive department, strategy, and culture that drives traffic and revenue for all profit centers. That's what a true BDC is. That is the unicorn that spit up Skittles, okay? The reality is that they don't really exist at that level because it's pretty damn complex. Now, does that sound like an accurate description of what a BDC should be at least, right? Yes or no? Interactive, please. Come on. Yeah? Now, now it makes sense what I said before about your BDC director. Is your BDC director capable to run that department? Is your internet director capable of doing that? To me, it's relative. To me, a BDC director, a real BDC director, is like a general manager. It is a general digital manager, if you, if you will. Because they're managing multiple different departments, multiple different initiatives, multiple different budgets, and, and, and ROIs, there's so much into it. You need a serious person to be a real BDC director if you're gonna do stuff at that level. And a BDC department is different than an internet department. Now, it's also relative. Let's just say, let's just, just say for the, just the, just the understanding and the vision here, for, let's cut all that out and we just stick with internet sales and phone sales. We'll just cut two, two modules. It's an internet department that takes phone ups. Let's say if you're selling, because I've got dealers that sell you know, 200 to 400 units a month from an internet department. Think about that. Let's say 100 units. The average dealership in the United States doesn't even sell 100 units. So if your internet department can deliver 100 units, deal with 800 to 1,000 leads a month, who should run that department? In my opinion, that's a GSM level caliber person, hands down. If you're selling like, you know, 80, like let's say 60 to 80, that's a strong, strong sales manager. Even if you're selling, you know, 40 or 50, that's like, you know, a salesperson that could be a sales manager. Somebody that's got sales management, TO experience, etc. If you need a digital person, get a digital marketing manager. You know, if you need an IT person, get an IT person. Don't make that person the position that you don't need. Too many times dealers don't have that sales manager or that advanced sales manager or that GSM for that department. But you get what you put into it. I was just showing in the other workshop, we got a dealership, it's a Chrysler Dodge dealership, went from 75 units on the internet to 245 units at $2,300 a copy. Okay, their internet director, GSM. And it's not the bastard child of the dealership. I mean, that person has got the authority and the power of a GSM. One of these, what, uh, there's a dealer group, a $1.1 billion dealer group in the Northeast, have 22 rooftops. The e-commerce director is, is more powerful than the individual general manager of the store because she runs 22 dealerships, 
e-commerce divisions for a $1.1 billion dealer group. They've got it right, though. She could be a GM in any of the stores. So you have to put the right person in that department. So again, how do you do that? Remember I said I started with the first slide is the strategy. Beginning with the end result in mind. Dr. Covey says begin with the end result in mind. What do you want to accomplish with your business development center? Is it internet? Is it phones? Is it data mining? Is it customer loyalty? Is it service? Is it this? Is it that? Once you answer those questions, that will go into now. What, you know, I, saw, well, I have more here. My bad. See, I forgot there's another slide here with more stuff for a BDC. Let's skip this and go to uh, what type of person is needed to run this. I love this slide. All right. So again, to me, a real BDC director needs to be able to understand how to do a 4P assessment. A BDC is made or broken, maximized or underutilized in four key areas. Your products, your people, your process, and your promotions. And I don't mean your inventory. When I say products, I mean your resources, like your CRM, your website, your V Auto stuff, your, um, your X time, you know, the, the, you know, the service scheduling you know, stuff on your website, uh, your customer loyalty, retention cards, anything that you're going to need, computers, headsets, your people. Who are your, you know, they need to be able to assess the people, everything from pay plans to schedules. Do you realize that prime time to connect on the phones is between 6 and 8 p.m.? I'm going to repeat that. Prime time to connect on the phone is between 6 and 8 p.m. We've gone in and analyzed one of the biggest problems that BDCs have. Not only are they not staffed the right way with the right amount of people, their schedule is jacked up. They've got people that only work to 9 to 5, 9 to 6, or the dealership's closed at 6 or whatever. That's like getting to the Super Bowl and get to halftime and say, thank you. See you next year. Next year comes. Get to halftime. Thank you again. See you next year. If prime time is to connect on the phones between 6 and 8 p.m. and you got a BDC, you need to have enough people there between 6 and 8 p.m. Agreed? So I know this might be basic, but a lot of dealerships really have gaping holes with the schedule. Now, pro uh, in process. What to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Everything from outbound, inbound email, outbound, inbound video, outbound, inbound text, outbound, inbound phones. I mean, so again, a BDC director needs to be able to do a SWOT assessment, identify the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of their four Ps, all their products, meaning resources, people, promotions, and all their processes. In addition to that, that alone is a lot, they've got to turn around and you know, basically be in charge of the pay plans for all of their subordinates, you know, making sure the commissions, the bonuses, the timesheets, all that's there. Mentoring, doing one-on-ones, if that even happens, doing one-on-ones, and how do you do a one-on-one, -on -one? and where are the benchmarks, and what is the, the evolution trajectory? Then you have you know, the schedules I talked about, leadering, leading, mentoring, employee management, personal development, promotions, you know, showroom, recognition, all this stuff. Um, everything from creating standard operating procedures. Like in your office, you usually have like uh, deal jackets and checklists from F and I or in the office. You know, a BDC director should be able to create checklists for, for things so they don't get dropped or, or misplaced or misunderstood. Creating standard operating procedures with accountability. Um, quality control. Everything from, again, projections, forecasting, and it's not just throwing money out the door, it's trying to identify ways to cut costs. How to reduce average cost per lead opportunity, average cost per sale. NADA says the average cost per sale in advertising per car for advertising is about 640 per car. Internet alone is 200 you know, per car sold. Some of the deals we have is like you know, 180. Again, it's, it's cheaper, more transparent, so your BDC director absolutely needs fiscal responsibility and skill set to be able not to just spend your money. Most BDC directors don't know how to go to you. They don't, they don't speak dealer and GM. They don't understand net profit. They could turn around and talk about how they could sell more cars by buying this and buying that, but I get it. It's not just selling more. It's selling more cars more often and more profitably. That has got to be part of a BDC's protocol. Oh, there's more. Check this out. <laughs> Time management, let's just go here. Um, goal management, goal focus, you know, task list, the projection management. Project management, time management is like critical. This is for my Franklin Covey training. You know, again, training, speakers, workshops, OEM modules, virtual training, video, etc. There's more. Okay, everything from vendor partner relationships management, communication, develop personal network, sustainment. You know, increase ROIs per sale, per lead, gross, you know, uh, gross profits. Your, your auto trader reps, your cars.com reps, your, your true car, all your reps and all your vendors need to be managed and massaged and held accountable. Who's going to do that? It's supposed to be the BDC director. Now, the puzzle piece here is this, in my opinion. The first place, this is the blueprint I'm giving you, the first place you want to start when you build a BDC if you already have one, it's a different strategy. But if you want to start the right way, that's, I only have so much time I could share. 
Internet sales and phone sales. Why Dr. Covey? Remember that one statement is, what's the one thing you could do to have the most dramatic effect in your organization? Internet. There's nothing more powerful. When 92 to 99% of Americans go online, that's what it is. Now, here's another thing. Nine out of 10 people on the internet prefer their phones. Folks, I am a phone beast, okay? But I'm also an author of a best-selling book for digital marketing, so I'm not like archaic, but an internet sale is a phone sale. Let me repeat that. An internet sale is predominantly a phone sale. Email sells the phone call, phone call sells the appointment, the, the appointment builds a relationship, product presentation, demo drive, delivery, done. So what you want to be able to do is start with the internet and phone and what fuses it together, the internet, the internet leads and the inbound phone ups, that's the beginning, that's the foundation for a strong BDC, in my opinion. The internet sales and the phone sales and what glues it together is your CRM processes, action plans, accountability, um, and just structure. Continuous training. My gosh, training topics, inbound, outbound phone, inbound, outbound email, like I said, texting, social media, engagement process, objections and rebuttals. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'm on camera, so I can't deny it. You know, if, I, I want to help you guys because I got to go through slides. If you guys want the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll give it to your NAD. I'll give you the PowerPoint. Not a big deal. You know, I'm trying to pack so much information. I feel bad you guys are take, take, take the pictures, but I'll give you the, the deck. It doesn't matter. All right. Um, if an idea says it's okay, of course. Um, what if scenarios? CRM. CRM training is really important. Video email process. Now, here's the thing. Who's heard that phrase that practice makes perfect? Good. I'm, I'm in the room with professionals. A lot of people think um, incorrectly that practice makes perfect. It doesn't. Practice makes permanent. If you're practicing the wrong thing, that's a bad thing because you're just basically developing muscle memory and habits of something wrong. So you're right, perfect practice or practicing the right things over and over again. Dr. Covey says it takes you know, 21 days to make or break or basically create a habit. Not, let me just cheat on the weekends you know, on a diet or whatever, it's like 21 straight days to make or break a habit. So remember, it's not having your team practice the wrong thing. Practice doesn't make perfect, it just makes permanent. So you wanna you know, practice and train on the right things. How do you train? Virtual training. To me, folks, virtual training, especially with technology now, uh, there's a lot of trading companies that have video on demand training, tracking, testing, certification, cost effective, 100% accountable. Then you have live training. You have, you know, basically whether they're consultants, they're trainers, they're manufacturers, people come to your store. There's CRM companies, there's BDC companies that come to your store on site training. Then there's coming to workshops and conventions. So you've got virtual training, you've got live training, you've got phone coaching. <sighs> Accountability. None of this means anything, again, unless you're willing to turn around and hold your people accountable. There's non-negotiables. I'm a business owner. We, I own multiple companies. So as a business owner to either business owners or executive managers, there's certain things that are non-negotiable in here. It doesn't mean that I'm a dictator or I'm a pirate. It's just you can't run a multi-million dollar business allowing people to do what they want when they want. You're not going to be able to scale up the right way. You have to have accountability and enforcement. And I know everybody in the room knows that, but there's a lot of degradation when it comes to BDC as it relates to accountability. How do you hold your people accountable? Certifications, creating a pro pay plan. Almost every one of the BDCs that I read, whether you are a BDC rep appointment setter or you're the internet or BDC director, if you only have one pay plan, you might think, well, because you, you have bonuses and stuff like that. If people think, you know, I got no shot in hitting that, why am I going to bother? So what, you want, what we recommend is that you have two pay plans at, at the very least. A basic pay plan for basic people, it is what it is, or a pro pay plan for people that are going to act professionally and do what they need to do. Make sense? Uh, call monitoring, staff meetings, daily scorecards, mystery shopping, you know, having your own standard operating procedures, projections, forecasting, goal setting. These are all examples of how you're going to be able to hold your people accountable. Add to your BDC. Once you have a net lift, so we started with the internet sales and the phone sales, right? I'm confused by that. So once you've got that in rhythm, once you're profitable, you've seen a net lift in your units and your gross, now what? I'm all about scaling into the BDC. I am a BDC expert and I sell more people, not just money, it's like conceptually, 
off of BDC at first. Because if you just launch in BDC, you have a very, very strong possibility of either failing or not being as profitable as you can be. What I try to do is incubate them, and it doesn't have to be like a year, it could be like 30, 60, or 90 days. Just get into rhythm with the foundation or core, and then go to the next one. But here's the slide, how do you choose? Analyze your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Analyze what's the most important to your organization. For your dealership, if you have one, just for example, it might be data mining, equity mining, because you have a 65% closing ratio, and you, you know, you've been there for 25 years. You're, just, you're leaving tons of opportunity. For somebody else, they might have a state-of-the-art you know, service department with like you know, 36 bays or whatever, and they're just not totally utilizing. The service writers are cherry-picking and scheduling appointments when, when they want to. So installing like a, you know, an automatic uh, web-based you know, uh, service scheduler and having a service BDC might be the best for them. Then there might be a dealership that's hemorrhaging on the showroom floor. You just lost your GSM or whatever, your sales manager, and you can't really get your salespeople to do what they're supposed to do. So you need to have a BDC to capture the lost opportunity or the, you know, the unsold showroom traffic. So again, not every dealership should build a generic BDC. If that was the case, folks, if everybody was the same, we'd have one manufacturer called Car. There'd be one color called Slate Gray and no options. Think about it. Why do we have so many different OEMs and models and options? And then if that's enough, we have aftermarket. Because there's different situations for different people in different areas with different wants, wishes, budgets, etc. Same thing with your BDC. Don't make it generic. It should be scaled according to your business needs and wants. How do you choose the next module in your BDC? I just went through all that. Be, I love this. Beware of distractions disguised as opportunities. I have ADD, in case you haven't noticed. So my wife's training me. Keys go here. You know, wallet goes there. Watch is there. So I, I roll those in my head every time I go somewhere because I least lose them all the time. So for me, like, be careful of distractions disguised as opportunities. Don't just do it because you know you got this vendor or manufacturer that says that this is great. Do it because it fits your business unique needs. Put first things first, and then you start scaling up. Data mining, lease retention, special finance, unsold show, service, whatever. Now they're kicking me off the stage. I could take this outside. Uh, so anybody that gets the questions, I don't mind answering questions outside. Thank you so much. Thank you.